and at the touch of your anointing, there's no curse. So let my praises move the heavens, and every song that I sing, make my life an offering. Center first, the word of God says that when two or three are gathered together in his name, that his presence follows. I see way more than two or three this morning. So can we just lift up our hands, lift up our voices, and lift up a high praise to the most high this morning? Lord, we worship you, Lord. We magnify the great name this morning, for you are worthy to be praised and worthy to be glorified.
Praise the Lord. We serve a great big God. Psalms 20 tells us. Sister Sarah, if you could help me out back there. Psalms 20 tells us the Lord. Hear thee in the day of trouble. The name of God of Jacob. Defend thee. Send thee help from the sanctuary and strengthen thee out of Zion. Remember all thy offerings and accept all thy burnt sacrifice. Selah, it says. Grant thee according to thine own heart and fulfill all thy counsel. We will rejoice in thy salvation and in the name of our God, we will set up banners. The Lord fulfill all thy petitions. Now know, that, now know I that the Lord saveth his anointed. He will hear him from his holy heaven with the saving strength of his right hand. Some trust in chariots, and I wanted to go to this text for this verse right here. Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. Some trust in chariots, some trust in horses, but we will remember the name of our God. They are brought down and fallen, but we are risen and stand upright. Praise the Lord. Save, Lord. Let the King hear us when we call. I am thankful that I understand there is only one God. I understand Understand that Jesus is alive and well and I put my trust in him and he is able and he is competent and he is confident in his ability and I'm thankful that I don't have to trust in horses I don't have to trust in chariots I don't have to trust in bank accounts I'll be honest with you I'm thankful that I don't have to trust in you and you should be so thankful that you don't have to trust in me, but we can trust in the one God that we serve. And I am thankful for the name of the Lord on this Sunday morning. Does anybody love the name of Jesus in the house this morning? Does anybody rely on the name of Jesus in the house this morning? Praise the Lord. It feels good in God's house. Let's give God one more good hand clap this morning. Praise the Lord. It is good to see everybody. You can be seated just for a few moments. It is good to see everybody in the house of the Lord. We're excited about what God's going to do in this United service this morning. We're looking forward to God doing some amazing things. Did you come expecting God to move this morning? Did you come expecting God to solve situations, solve problems, restore relationships, I am thankful that we have a God who cares. Praise the Lord. It is good to see everybody. If you are a guest this morning, praise the Lord. We are so excited that you're with us. We're so glad that you have chosen Center First this morning to be with us. We want you to feel at home. We want you to feel welcome. We want you to feel like this is a place that you could join right in and help us as we lift up the name of our Lord. Praise, praise the Lord. Everybody say one service. One service. We do not have a p.m. service tonight. This is our one shot today to have a good time in the house of the Lord. We're going to have a good time. God's going to bless. God's going to come down and take over. And I'm not being prophetic. I'm just speaking in faith. I believe God's going to bless this morning. But we do not have church here tonight. Uh, we, we're only going to have this one service this morning. Praise the Lord. You've been so faithful in your giving through the years. You've been so faithful and God has blessed you. The tithing and the offering boxes or at the back of the sanctuary this morning. You can also give on the church app. You can give that way online if you would like to. When you give to the work of the Lord, God has promised to send it back to you, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. And God has proven himself through the years that when you're faithful in your giving, he is faithful to bless. Can anybody say amen? Praise the Lord. Speaking of the church app, we have a church directory. This month we have put forth an effort to update our church directory. A little birdie told me before service that one family has updated the directory. Praise the Lord. That means we're all up to date. That means everybody's got accurate information. That means everybody's got accurate pictures. Mission accomplished. But if not, we need you to go to the Welcome Center. If you've had some address changes this year, if you've had some phone number changes, if maybe your picture has changed a little bit, 
We need to get some new pictures of everybody. I playfully talk about how when I meet you after service or before service or during service, when I meet everybody in the house of the Lord, sometimes I don't remember names, but I can remember faces, and I can scroll through that directory and start to put my two brain cells together so that I remember your names and I remember your faces, and I can put those things together. But if it's not updated and I pull up the directory and you don't have a picture in there, then I'm still in the dark. Praise the Lord. So we need to update the church directory if you have not seen them out at the Welcome Center. Please do so and let's get that taken care of. Everybody say, all you men say March 2nd. Let's try that again. All you men say March 2nd. All right, ladies, help us out. Let's say March 2nd. Praise the Lord. We have a men's community fellowship and breakfast March 2nd at 9 a.m. at the Wyndham, at the Wyndham Civic Center. That is March 2nd at 9 o'clock in the morning. It's a community breakfast and fellowship. We're inviting the community. We have catering going to be there. Great series of events going to take place during that. Good time of fellowship, good time of breakfast foods, good time of just getting to know each other and reaching out to our community. If you have a friend, men, if you have a friend that is not part of this church that you would like to bring to that, tell them to come with you. Bring them along. We're looking forward to a great time there. That is coming up March 2nd at 9 o'clock at the Wyndham Civic Center right up the road here. We're going to be looking forward to a good time, but we kind of need to know for sure that everybody's going to be there and our men are going to work to reach our community. Everything we try to do in the church, let me rephrase that, everything we, everything in our church should try to reach out to our community we should try to be constantly be a light that's set on a hill everything that we do should work towards bringing souls to a throne where they can meet a God who is alive and well everything that we do should be towards reaching souls reaching out and this community breakfast for our men is that is one of those events where we're trying to reach our community praise the Lord it is good to be in God's house did you come expecting God to do some things we're going to go right back into praise and worship I want us to stand one more time this morning if you would and let's continue to magnify the name of our Lord we serve a great big God he is faithful and he's good and he's able let's magnify Jesus Intro. this morning Two, three four
needs to realize the God that you serve some might call him a way maker some might call him a water walker some might call him a healer some might call him a savior and I think this morning somebody needs to realize the God that we serve is alive and well oh come on church is anybody hearing what we're singing this morning our God has proven himself our God has proven that he is able. Our God has proven that he is good. And I think we ought to magnify him. Some would say he's a promise keeper. Some would say he's a covenant keeper. Some would say that our God, if he promises something to you, is faithful and able to come forth with his promises. We serve a God that is alive and well, and he is a promise keeping God, if God has promised you anything in your life, he is able to fulfill that promise and he's faithful to us. Come on church, let's magnify God. Hallelujah. You'll never leave me You said that you won't forsake me And you're right beside me And that is all that matters you never leave me you said that you won't forsake me and you're right beside me and that is all that matters you are a covenant keeping god you are a covenant Covenant keeping God, Yahweh, the covenant keeping God. Ooh, yes. Ooh, you keep your promises, Lord. Ooh. You'll never leave me. You said that you won't. Oh, God, 
you lift up your hands across this place today. Come on, the Lord's going to keep his promises. Every promise he's made, he will fulfill it. He doesn't break his word. He's a covenant-keeping God. Doesn't matter where you are, would you lift those hands up right now and say, I trust in my God that he said he would do it, he's going to do it. He never goes back on what he says. God is a covenant-keeping God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. That word covenant is not one-sided. We often think that God is obligated or God will do his part. And, but that word covenant is two parts. It's not one-sided. In a covenant, it's like a marriage. When you got married, it's, it's really not uh, what the world thinks marriage is. Really, marriage is a covenant. It's really what marriage is. It's two people coming together and both sides saying, I will give this and I will, and it's a covenant. And God is a covenant-keeping God, meaning that when we are in covenant with Him, He will keep His part. And that's why when you are a child of God and you are um, living for the Lord with all your heart according to the Word of God, you can say with confidence that He will keep His end of the bargain. He's a covenant-keeping God. If you're sick in your body and you're living for God, you can say confidently God is going to come through. Because God's a covenant-keeping God. You know, you can almost just say God is, take the word keeping out, you really can. Because saying keeping God is, is signifying that, that he could, he could not, but he's going to keep it. The truth is, you could just say he's a covenant God. Period. He's a covenant God. And it doesn't matter what you're going through this morning. If you walk faithfully before God, not perfection, none of us will ever reach perfection until we get to that side. But if you are pursuing after God and you are living according to God's word, you can be confident that God is a covenant God and he will fulfill every promise he's spoken to us. Amen. Would you give the Lord a great hand clap of praise in the house? I want you to turn with me to 1 Chronicles chapter 16, verse number 11. 1 Chronicles 16, verse number 11. And I want to say to everyone this morning, thank you for being here. What a wonderful crowd this morning. Amen. I know this is a united service, and we've got everybody in here today. We've got our children in here. And I'm going to tell you what, don't we have some of the best acting kids in all the world I mean my goodness you almost have to look around and really look to see if there's kids in here they are so well behaved and and we know kids are going to be kids my goodness let, let, let's let kids be kids and parents you know how to take care of them amen but kids are kids and and we're so glad and then we have our young people in here on this front row I'm gonna tell you what I preach better when they're in here amen we got next gen. We got everybody in here. And so I'm so glad to see everybody in here. However, how many are ready for the day when we have Sunday school filled up, youth filled up, and the sanctuary looks like this? Come on, somebody. Amen. Amen. God is good. We have been, we have been pushing around 340, 330, somewhere around there. And and uh, God is good, and, and I'm expecting us to one day be pushing 400, amen, because God's not done winning the lost. Come on, somebody. God's not done reaching and winning the lost, and so we are excited for what we see. First Chronicles chapter 16, verse 11, amen. Keep everybody on our prayer list in your prayers. Please keep praying for them. Amen. We have got so many great reports that are coming out of our time of fasting and praying. Amen. And we're going to continue to look for that. And we will be coming shortly in the next several weeks with some more things along the lines of testimonies of miracles that God has been doing. And uh, we'll be doing that shortly. First Chronicles chapter 16 verse 11 says, Seek the Lord and His strength. Seek His face continually. Would you read that with me again? Seek the Lord and His strength. Seek His face continually. 
Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and then you can be seated in the house this morning. Lord, we give you high praise this morning. We thank you, Lord, for all that you are doing. And we just come in this place today asking God that we would grow closer to you, that you would speak to us, that we walk out of this place changed, transformed, never the same again because every encounter with you is life-changing. There's never been a moment in your presence that you did not do something that altered our life, and we thank you for it. And everybody say, in Jesus' name. You can be seated. Thank you. Many times in the Bible, we see where we are commanded to seek after God. We read that in 1 Chronicles 16 and 11, where it says that we are to seek the Lord and His strength, that we are to seek His face, not occasionally, but we are to seek His face continually. Jeremiah 29 and 13 tells us, and ye shall seek me and find me when ye shall search for me with all of your heart. Jeremiah is telling us that we are to seek after God. That when we do that, we're going to find him. But the key is when we do it with all of our heart. It's important that we seek for God with everything that we have. Just a side note, let me say it like this. There is uh, no way... And it is absolutely impossible to find God like you need him to be if we are doing it half-heartedly. A whole heart is what it takes to find him. Hebrews chapter 11, verse number 6 says, But without faith, would you say without? But without faith, it is impossible. Not possible. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is. And that he is a rewarder of them that what? Diligently seek him. Not just seek him, but diligently seek him. In other words, it's not like when I ask my wife, I can't find those socks. And she walks in there and opens the top drawer and lo and behold, there they are. All the, oh my God, all the ladies are turning to their husbands right now. <laughs> They're saying, pastor's preaching to you right now, hallelujah. And I tell my wife, I looked for them. And she says, you didn't what? Look hard enough, amen. And so in Hebrews, it tells us that we are to diligently seek for him that we are to put our whole heart into finding him and when we diligently seek for him then there is a reward that will come with seeking him now from cover to cover we are admonished we are commanded to seek the Lord would you say amen if you believe that that we are commanded to seek the Lord we are told of great rewards and of great of, of receiving God's presence when we search diligently for Him. It is a common theme that we are to chase Him. It is a common theme in the Word of God that we are to be about God's business. It is a common thread throughout God's Word from cover to cover that the people of God should be a people that desire Him, that search for Him that seek after him, that look for him. They are, uh, that, that we are to look for him and that we are to be about him. It then seems almost out of order to then see that this God who commands us to come after him, to uh, instruct us to seek after him, it almost seems out of order when you get in God's word and you go from verse to verse to verse that tells us that we ought to turn our face towards him and we ought to seek diligently for him. It almost seems out of order when we come across the word that tells us that not only does he command us and instruct us to seek after him, but we see that he wants to seek after us. The Bible is very clear that we are to seek after him. 
The Bible's very uh, obvious that our breath and our body is to seek Him and to praise Him. But I found it rather peculiar when I studied the Word of God and I find out that this is not a one-sided thing. That living for God is not one-sided and it's not just about you praising and worshiping and seeking after God. But God, in fact, is wanting to seek after us. And I want to preach to us this morning on this subject. And I think I'm probably going to take the next couple of weeks to preach this. Because as I began to study yesterday, there was so much there that I had to break it into a couple of weeks because we'd be here till 4 o'clock. Now, I know most of you would be okay with that, but I think there's a few that would lose you. And so I want to preach to us today in in the next couple of weeks, if I could, on the God who seeks. The God who seeks seeks the God who seeks it almost seems unfathomable that the God of the universe now I want you to hear this this morning that the God of the universe who spoke everything into existence who caused the light to be there and the stars to be there and the moon and the sun to be there and everything that we take for granted because it's always there that God who created it all it seems almost unfathomable that that God of the universe that that God of that ability and power would be looking for us And while the Bible is a story of man seeking God, let's be sure of this fact that it is also ultimately the story of God seeking man. And I don't know who's here this morning, but you hear this preacher. God is seeking for you. Doesn't matter where you came from. Doesn't matter what you've been in. Doesn't matter your baggage or your past. Your God is not just looking for you to worship him, but he's looking to seek after you and what he can do in your life. Hallelujah. Genesis chapter three and verse number eight through nine. It tells us, and they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord. Always a bad idea. You know, that's how the devil works. Not in my notes, but let me just say it. That's how the devil works. He wants you to get outside of the presence of God. That's his purpose. Because inside the presence of God, there's liberty and there's freedom and there's healing. Turn to your neighbor and stay stay in the presence of God. So the Bible says, and they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam. I want you to see this picture. The God who seeks. The God who seeks. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, where art thou? He was searching for him. He was searching for her. He was looking for them. He was seeking after them. It was important for God to find them. It was important for God to be able to locate them. And God is wanting to locate you. And God is wanting to find you. And God is, God is, his, his focus is on you. And he wants to know where are you. God was looking for them. He was seeking for them. So God is looking for people. And that's hard for us to understand because we often think that we need to seek God because he tells us to. But we serve a God who is also looking and searching for people. He is seeking after us. But what kind of people? Because it matters. The Bible has a lot to say about who God is seeking for. Who is God searching for? What type of people is it that God is looking for? And so we're going to spend the next several weeks talking about the types of people that God, according to his word, is seeking after. Because God commands us to seek him, but I want you to also know he is seeking people. It is a common theme, uh, I'm sorry, it is, it is in the Bible uh, that God gives us the understanding and he says a lot about the people that he's looking for. And so the next couple of weeks, let's look at the type of people that God is seeking after. 
John chapter 4, verse 23 says, But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. And the Father, here it is, and the Father seeketh such to worship him. Verse 24, God is a spirit. Would you say God is a spirit? And they that worship him must worship him in what? Spirit and in truth. John says, I want you to hear these words, that there is coming a day, and it is now, that God is seeking, searching, looking for a type of person and the type of person that he is seeking for and the type of person that he is wanting and the type of person that he is looking for is this, that they are a worshiper. Can I say it like this? Today, we're gonna talk about the first type of person that God is seeking after and that is he is seeking the worshipers. Uh, See, we think worship is a Pentecostal thing. We think worship is a Brother Winslow thing. We think worship is a sinner first thing. We think worship may be just a Texas thing. We think worship is a UPC thing. But I've come to tell you that the fact that we are a worshiping people and we are a people that praise God is not because it's a denomination. It's not because you walked into a church that just simply believes in it. It's not because you got a pastor that just preaches is it? It's because the Lord said, I am seeking those who will worship me. He's seeking that kind of person. That's why every opportunity that we got to praise him and worship him, we ought to praise him. Why? Because the Bible says he's seeking after you. I'm here to tell somebody this morning, God is looking and he's searching for a people that know how to worship and magnify him. Come on, there's lots of things that can be said about you. There's lots of things that people can say about you. But if they can say one thing, let them say this. That Brother Winslow is a worshiper. That the people of Center First are worshipers. Hallelujah. We can never get to the place. I know you're saying, Brother Winslow, I've heard you preach it before. Brother Winslow, I hear it all the time. But the reason why is we got to understand we can never get away from the simple fact that God is searching and seeking after people. And I want to know what is he looking for. Because here's the key. If I can find out who he's looking for and I can step into that role, guess what that means? He's coming for me. And when he shows up, guess what he brings? He brings power, healing, restoration, miracle, salvation, redemption, and forgiveness. I want to be one of those people that he's seeking for. Hallelujah. The worshipers. I want us to see this Jesus. He has gathered disciples unto himself here in John and is now leaving Judea. And he and his disciples, they are making their way unto Jerusalem. And here from Judea unto Jerusalem, there's really only one way. That's why the Bible says that we must go through Samaria. It wasn't always just that he had a purpose, although there was, but it was also because that was just the way to get to Jerusalem. And Jerusalem was the place that they were going. That was the destination. But between Judea and Jerusalem was a place called Samaria. And that's where the Bible tells us that he got to a place in Samaria, a city within Samaria called Sakar. And it was there that they got into Sakar. And Jesus and his disciples make their way to a well. And when they got to the well, they stopped and Jesus said, go into the city and I want you to purchase some food. While they're gone, Jesus is there at the well. I want to say something to all of us today. That many of us, if we want to get to where God is, that's Jerusalem for Jesus and his disciples. He had to go through Samaria. Samaria was an unwanted place. Samaria was a place that no Jew wanted to be called in. 
Samaria was a city that no Jew would want to stay and commute and, and be there. He wanted to be in Jerusalem, not, not in Samaria. But I want to say to somebody, oftentimes, for us to get where we are to our destination, we got to go through some places that are unwanted and some places that we don't want to be at and some places that we'd rather miss. And some, I'm preaching to us this morning that there are some places and some situations that we don't want to be in. But God says, trust me, for me to get you to Jerusalem, for me to get you from here to that miracle, for me to get you from here to that blessing, there's going to be some unwanted places and some undesired situations that are there to prepare you for Jerusalem. I'm telling somebody in this house this morning, hold on to God in the midst of what you're going through. God's got a plan. Ooh, hallelujah. I don't want to struggle, but sometimes I got to go through Samaria to get to Jerusalem. I don't want to go through this, Brother Winslow. Why is God allowing this? Because sometimes God said, I got a greater plan in Samaria than in Jerusalem. Could it be that God says, I'm going to heal you, but just hold and trust on to me because I got some things I'm trying to teach you in this season that are more valuable than just your miracle? Some of you waiting for God to heal your body, but God's trying to teach you something. And God's saying, I'm going to heal you. I'm going to take care of you. But there's something you got to get here in Samaria. And so it is that Jesus, he goes to the well, and he's standing there alone. And, 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 and here in this unwanted place, in this undesirable place, in this what seems to be a detour to the journey. I'm going to tell somebody, I feel this in the Holy Ghost, you better get your eyes off the destination and start enjoying the journey. Some of us, we can't worship until we get to Jerusalem, and God is saying, what about right now? See, we so, hey, when I get my miracle, when I get my blessing, when I get my bonus, when I, you, you got your mind on the destination and God's trying to tell you, hey, why don't you thank me for every step that I put breath in your body? Don't wait till you get your bonus. Wake up and say, I praise you, God. I thank you, God, because I got breath in my body. We ought to thank God now in the journey. Come on, we're a people in a society that all we think about is when we get there. You know, we can't wait till we get to Florida because that's when vacation begins. Not in the Winslow house. Vacation begins when we get in the van and we stop at Bucky's. <laughs> Some of y'all, 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 y'all missing everything on the way because all you think is the sand and the ocean. And you miss all the laughter in the van and all the smiling in the van and all the giggles in the van and all the jokes with your family and you don't care about that because you're just trying to get to the beach. I'm telling somebody, it's time for you to recognize how good God's been to you and stop just standing there waiting for something big and say, God, I'm gonna praise you that I got food in my cupboard. I got some kind of, it may not be perfect, but I do got some health in my body. Because God is seeking worshipers. I'm not going to wait till I get there. We play games on the way to the beach. You better believe I'm ready to get to the beach. Me and Sister Winslow, we water people. It could be a lake, river, pond, ocean. We love the water. And you better believe I want to get to the beach. I want to get to that water. But I'm not going to miss everything that happens from here to there. And God is saying, listen, I want you to stop in Samaria because there's something that's got to take place that's, that in this moment is more valuable than just Jerusalem. And so here he is. He's, he, he is at the well. And, and, and then this woman comes to the well. She's a Samaritan. Strike one. She comes to the well and... He begins to talk to her and she's talking to him strike two because not only is in those days a woman not supposed to talk to a Jew and not supposed to talk to a man, but Jesus is a rabbi. Yes, he is. He was a rabbi. and You could not address a rabbi. So she's breaking all kinds of laws and Jesus is breaking them too. Hallelujah. 
And Jesus begins to have this dialogue with her in John and begins to talk to her about living water. And he says, uh, you know, if you get this water that I'll give, you'll never thirst again. And then he begins to tell her everything about her life and all the ins and outs and the ugly pieces of her life and exposing things that nobody else knows. And this stranger surely could not know these things about her life and her living situation, her relationships. And she looks at him and says, I perceive that thou art a prophet of God and then she says uh, about worshiping God upon this mountain but you say that we should or they say that we should worship in Jerusalem because Samaritans they, they hated each other because Samaritans believed that you worship God in Samaria on the hill but the Jews believed you worshiped in Jerusalem and they hated each other and here's Jesus I want you to see this he's in this moment in Samaria unwanted shouldn't be there can't make any sense and he responds back he says the hour is coming and it is now that my father is seeking those who will worship him in spirit and truth what he was saying is I got a revelation for you I got something I want you to catch on to that it doesn't matter what's going on in your life it doesn't matter your theology or what you think I want you to understand that the thing that God is looking for is somebody who will step outside of their own self and will say I am going to worship up God I like what David said David said in Psalms 34 and 1 he said I will bless the Lord at all times his praise shall continually be in my mouth he said Bless the Lord at all times. Your car messes up. What do you do? You bless the Lord. When your health starts acting up, what do you do? You bless the Lord. When your marriage isn't going so well, what do you do? You stop and you raise your hands and you bless the Lord. When your children are acting up, what do you do? You stop and you bless the Lord. Listen, David said you gotta bless him at all times. That means even when it doesn't make sense, you praise him. That means even when nothing makes sense, you worship him. That means even when you don't feel it, you praise him. That means that when nothing makes sense and I got no reason to shout and I got nothing I can hold in my hand, I'm just gonna stop for a moment and lift those hands and say, God, I worship you. God, I magnify you because I know you're seeking after worshipers. God's not seeking complainers. He's looking for worshipers. Hallelujah. Come on, somebody. Elbow your neighbor softly so no one else sees it but you. Come on. I know we can get in the mully grubs. I know we can go through things. I know life ain't fair. Listen to me. Just because Brother Winslow said yes to preaching and said yes to pastoring this great church doesn't mean I am, I am exempt from pain, trouble, and trials. Just because I said, yes, God, I'll preach, doesn't mean all of a sudden he just stepped in and says, no more trouble for you, man of God. But you know, the difference between me and a lot of folks in this church is I've learned that he is seeking worshipers. And so what am I gonna do? In spite of how all hell has broke loose in my life and in spite of all the sickness that's going on around us and everything, I've just learned, me and Sister Winslow have learned that no matter how mad you are at me and no matter how mad I might be at you and no matter how much the kids are driving us crazy and the money's not there and all of these things, we are going to give Give God the highest praise that we can give him. So I'm gonna clap my hands when I don't feel it. Come on, I said I'm gonna clap my hands even when I don't feel it. You say, Brother Winslow, that's silly. No, that's Bible. You say, Brother Winslow, worship silly. No, it's Bible. You say, worship is just something you want, Brother Winslow. No, it's God is seeking worshipers. The Bible never says one time he's seeking the intelligent. The Bible never one time says he's seeking the wealthy. The Bible never one time says he's seeking the poor. Doesn't say it. Doesn't mean the gospel ain't for the poor. It just means that that's, he is seeking worshipers. 
He is seeking those who will worship Him. In spite, I'm telling you, it will revolutionize your life if you'll just finalize it and say, it doesn't matter if my family isn't known for anything else. They're going to say, there goes the worship in Winslow's. Now, I know some of you think I shouldn't do this, but I'll do it anyways, don't care. But I tell people all the time, you ain't going to out-worship me. And people are like, my God, Brother Winslow, that's for the Lord. It's not a contest. But I've told, I told Kate, I don't know how many times, every time he'd come up there, I told him, I said, don't, don't get in front of me. Don't out-worship me. And the other day he got up there and he looked at me and goes, and took one step in front of me. I said, you dog, Hallelujah. So if you ever see me and Brother Cade having a worship war over here, you know what's happening. Just let us worship. Amen. Hallelujah. God will get something out of that, I guess. <laughs> I just made up my mind. We're going to worship God. I'm not trying to be you. You don't have to be me. But God is seeking worshipers. He's, and it'll change your life when you just make up your mind. It doesn't matter what happens over here. And it, it doesn't matter what this is. It doesn't matter about that. I know, I, I know I'm weary and I'm tired. I'm, I understand that. But I'm going to come in the house of God. And, and listen, not even just in the house of God. How many of you in your own home worship? Come on, there's nothing more beautiful than when you put a little bit of worship music on in your house and you just walk through the house and you begin to say, I magnify you, Jesus. I worship you. I praise you. Something about that just changes the atmosphere in your home. Hallelujah. Brother Conway, I love you. Sister Conway was such a special lady. I tell you what, I remember I went to go visit them. I went in that house and I was sitting there and, and there was such a peace of God that was in that home. And I remember just thinking, oh, my word, what just a, just a peace and wonderful presence of God that was in that place. I'm going to tell you, this is my opinion. He can correct me later. But I think it's because they're worshipers. You can tell it when you go in a house of a worshiper. You can feel it. It feels different when you get in a house of someone who understands I'm a worshiper. It feels different in their house. There's, I, I know there was peace in that home because they knew that they are worshipers. And when you understand that you are a worshiper, it will change the dynamics of your marriage. You can say, hey, listen, you sit there in the mullet groves if you want to, but I'm going to worship God. I'm going to praise God. And you can sit there and be mad at me. You want to. We'll talk about it later. But I'm going to worship God. Why? Because he's seeking those who will worship him if we can ever get past the concept that this is a Pentecostal thing and this is a Brother Winslow thing and this is a Sunday morning thing and this is a Sunday night thing and we got a level 5 on Sunday morning and a level 12 on Sunday night I can't wait till the day when some of you act on Sunday morning like you do on Sunday night Hey, I, I'm ready to scare some of these new people. <laughs> I'm ready for some of these visitors to leave and go, my God, what was that? They come in here on Sunday morning, some of y'all, so. And they leave going, huh? Huh? Come on, I'm ready for us to catch on that it doesn't matter when we come in this building. I'm going to worship God whether it's Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. It don't matter. Revival services, children's revivals. It don't matter. I'm a worshiper. <laughs> Hallelujah. Somebody say praise God. Oh, hell can break loose in your life this past week or this past year, but you got to learn to bless the Lord. You say, Brother Winslow, will that change it? It may not change your circumstance, but it will change you. Come on, I'm not, I'm not going to get up here and tell you that every time you clap your hands, you're going to get $100 in the mail. Come on, we're not selling holy water. But I will tell you, when you understand the concept of I'm a worshiper, it will change the dynamic of how you view things. Hallelujah. It'll change things. You see, a worshiper is a person who steps into a place that no matter what is going on around me, I'm the one that he is seeking for. Can I just say it like this? If you're needing more of him, become a worshiper. And you'll have no problem finding him. Because he's attracted to it. Hallelujah. You say, how do I get more of the Lord in my life? Start worshiping. 
Start worshiping. Start praising God. And you'll find out that God's attracted to those who worship. You know what is so amazing about God? It's the uniqueness of his worshipers. Take a look around. Not everybody looks as good as you, right? (laughs) Come on, take a look around. It's a unique crowd, isn't it? Somebody say amen. The uniqueness of worshipers is what's so awesome about God. The woman at the well was viewed as with not much to offer. She was an outcast in that society. She was to be not spoken to and could not speak to them. She was out of place, yet she was a worshiper. Nicodemus was a Pharisee. He was wealthy and influential, but he came to Jesus at night, and eventually he turned into a worshiper of Jesus. And we know this because when Jesus was on the cross, it was Nicodemus with Joseph who came and pulled him off the cross. He was a worshiper. Can you see the dynamic? We have a worshiper who had very little to offer, very little to say that I can give you this, yet God said you are a worshiper. On the other scope, we had someone who could write a check for anything and they were a worshiper and both were worshipers praising God. I've come to remind us it doesn't doesn't matter where you're from and it doesn't matter what you look like and it doesn't matter your dynamics of your family you can be a worshiper he's not seeking wealthy worshipers he's not seeking poor worshipers he's not seeking intellectual worshipers he's not seeking ignorant worshipers he is just simply saying anybody that has breath praise ye the Lord Can I say it like this? You want to know what the criteria is to praise him? Take in a deep breath and exhale. Qualified. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Hallelujah. You may have more money than anybody. Praise him. You may not have anything to rub together, no pennies to rub together. Praise him. You may be the smartest in this building. Praise him. You may be the one that struggles and can't put things together. Praise him. You may be wearing a suit and a tie behind this pulpit. Praise him. You may be sitting on the pew, never preach a message. Praise him. Why? Because he's just seeking for worshipers. Ooh, hallelujah. Somebody say Hallelujah. We put too many tags and labels on what God's looking for. He's just looking for someone to worship him. Come on, he's just looking for somebody to worship him. The uniqueness of his worshipers is what makes God so amazing. He opens the door for all. Oh, somebody should have got real excited like that because just a couple years ago you didn't look so great. And if everybody knew what you really were like, yet God says you're a worshiper. Hallelujah, a worshiper. It doesn't matter what you come from, doesn't matter your background, Jesus is just looking for worshipers. You may not be perfect and have it all together. You have made mistakes yesterday, maybe last night, maybe on the way this morning, you made mistakes. Cussed everybody out on the way. Well, get an altar, repent, and begin to worship. Come on, somebody. Got two amens, hallelujah. You may have messed up Friday night. Get in an altar, repent, ask God to forgive you, and then begin to worship him. The greatest lie of hell is that you made mistakes and you're not worthy to worship him. So when you do that, you sit on a pew and you don't magnify God because of condemnation and guilt. Get that under the blood. Let God wash that away and then lift those hands and begin to praise him again. You ought to tell the devil I've made mistakes, but I'm a worshiper. I I messed up, but I'm a worshiper. I know I didn't do that right, but I'm a worshiper. I know my attitude wasn't the best, but I'm a worshiper. I'm going to get it right because I'm going to keep praising God. Somebody say amen. Amen. The ten lepers were healed by Jesus. Only one comes back and falls down and worships Jesus. Jesus tells them, go, you're made whole. That's because he values those who worship him. The nine got healed, one got whole. I don't know about you, but I'm not just looking for a miracle here or there. I want God to make me whole. I want everything to be fixed. I want everything to be well. I don't want just a little miracle here and a little miracle there. I want him to look at me and say, Gordon Winslow, be made whole. I want him to take care of it all. 
that comes because he's seeking worshipers. He loves worshipers. For us to get a better understanding of praise and worship, I want us to look at some words in your Bible. Would you say, my Bible? Just so you don't think this is Brother Winslow making them up. This is in your Bible. Turn to your neighbor and say, it's in your Bible. Turn to your other neighbor and say, it's in my Bible. I want us to look at it because what does it mean when we say worship? Because everybody's got their own idea, but how do you know the Bible's got the best ideas? Amen. Come on, the Bible has the best things about your marriage. The Bible says the best things about your relationships. The Bible says the best things about everything that we need in our life. It's, it is the Word of God. Let's look at some words that will give us a better understanding of what worship is. These aren't all the words in your Bible, but these are some of the most prominent words in Hebrew that give us an understanding of worship. And for some of us, it's going to let us understand why it is sinner first does what it does. Because some of you looking around saying, well, that's just what Brother Winslow does. He's excited. Yeah, I got some of y'all. Well, I don't do that. That's not me. Uh-huh, win a million dollars and let's see if, if the me changes. Mm -hmm. Because I don't worship because that's a Brother Winslow thing. Because I'll be real honest, I could comfortably sit on a pew like you too. So let's look at what worship means. These aren't all of them, but these are the most prominent. And these aren't all the verses, only a few because we ain't got all day. The first word is Barak. It's your Hebrew word, Barak. It literally means to kneel or to bow. To kneel or to bow. It's in Psalms 34 and 1. I want you to see it. Psalms 34 and 1. It says, I will bless. Would you say bless? I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. When we say I will bless the Lord, we just come up with all kinds of things. But that word bless is barak. It means to kneel or to bow. When he said Psalms, David said I will bless the Lord. He was saying I will kneel. I will kneel. I will bow before the Lord. I will bless the Lord at all times. I, I will put some movement. Listen to me. It means something in the Hebrew more than just this mental thing that I'll bless him. David said when I bless him, he said I will bow down. I will get on my knees. Psalms 104 says, enter his gates with thanksgiving. Have you heard that one? Yeah, we all quote that, don't we? But do we realize what we're quoting? I don't think we do. He says, enter his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name. The word bless is Barak. It means when you bless his name, it's that getting on your knees and bowing down to his name. Psalms 95 and 6 says, Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker. This is where they got it right. The King James Version translated it right here. It's the same word, Barak. The other two, they translated bless. Here they translated it to kneel. They got it right. It's saying, listen, I'm going to kneel. I'm going to bow. I'm going to bow. Another word is gil. It means, watch this now, it means to spin around under the influence of an of any violent emotion lest you look at some of us who are shouting and dancing and worshiping and spinning and you think it's foolishness it's in your Bible right. Amen. Ooh, ooh, thank you seven hallelujah see some people say well that's just what no 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 every denomination should be doing that it shouldn't be Pentecostals it should be everybody I don't understand why y'all do that, Brother Winslow. I, don't, I think that's emotions. Well, your, your Bible in the Hebrew says that it is an influence of any violent emotion to spin around. I want you to, I want you to picture this word in Hebrew, Gil, when I read these verses. Psalms 32 and 11 says, Be glad in the Lord and rejoice. We think rejoice. Woo! That's not what it means. That word rejoice is Gil. He's saying this, Be glad in the Lord and spin around. Uh, see, some of y'all like, well, you know, Brother Winslow, that's not what I do. But the Bible says that when you rejoice, there's something to it. 
That's why we dance and that's why we leap and that's why we shout. It's not because somewhere down the line our grandfather decided, hey, how about we try this? It's because in God's word, it gave us examples of how to be a worshiper. And I'm gonna encourage everybody in this house that when God starts moving on you and you begin to want to worship, get out of that pew and begin to shout and dance. Hallelujah. Somebody say hallelujah. Psalms 35 and 9, and my soul shall be joyful in the Lord. It shall rejoice in his salvation. Psalms 118, 24, this is the day that the Lord has made. Are you ready for this? How many of you quoted this one? This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. And then we just walk away. He said, "Ah." Uh-uh. Rejoicing is there's some movement to it. There's some kind of emotion to it when we rejoice. That's why when this church, when we rejoice, you're going to see some emotion. You're going to see some movement because the Bible declares that worship has something to it. Somebody say amen. The word halal in Hebrew means to praise, to make a show or rave about. You say, Brother Winslow, sure you're all showing off in here. Yeah, because the Bible tells us to make a show of him. Psalms 22 and 23. I know some of y'all didn't know that was in there, did you? Because we have told you what it means, but what does the Bible say about worship? The Bible says to praise, to make a show or rave about. Psalms 22 and 23 says, you who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, glorify him and fear him. All you offspring of Israel. Another word is renan. It means to creak, to emit a stridious sound, to shout aloud for joy. This is Psalms 33 and 1 that says rejoice. See, if you don't know what they mean, you just think all the words rejoice mean the same, but they don't. This word rejoice means that there's be something in your mouth that you open and you say hallelujah. There's, I'm telling somebody in this house that the greatest thing you can do against your enemy that's coming against you is open your mouth and begin to praise God with a loud voice. Hey, I may not be anything that scares the devil, but I'm gonna open my mouth and let him know I'm here. Hallelujah. I know some of us, I don't take a lot on that one. Others, it's going to take some practice, hallelujah, to shout and praise God with a loud voice. Praise the Lord. The next word is shakal. Shakal means to depress or prostrate in homage or loyalty to God. Bow down, flat down, flat, lay down flat, prostrate, lay out flat. It's found in Psalms 29 and 2. It says this, give unto the Lord the glory that do his name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. The next word is shur, which means to sing or be a singer. Psalms 1849. Therefore, I will give thanks to you, O Lord, among the Gentiles and sing praises to your name. You know why we sing together and we're worshiping? And you know why we got the lyrics up there so you can sing along? Because that's what worship is. When you open your mouth and you begin to say, I will praise the Lord at all times. And you begin to sing together. That is worship. That's why some of us, you may not clap your hands and run the aisles. Okay. But if you can open your mouth and begin to sing along with the body, if you can just begin to sing songs unto God, that is worship. Woo, hallelujah. My daughter Kate, she loves singing. She makes up songs. Anybody got somebody like that? She just makes them up. We're driving home from school. She'll just start singing songs. And my good thing, theologically correct. (laughs) She'll just, ah, Jesus, I love you in the hills. And she just, I mean, and I, we're just laughing. We just turned the, everything down and we're just listening to her. And she just, you are the God that comes along. You should have seen it. She's just singing. And she makes up these songs and she's singing. And, 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 and initially I thought, oh, that's cute. But then the Lord said, no, she's worshiping me. She's worshiping me. She, she's singing a song. It may not be the ones you wrote, and it may not be the ones in a book, and it may not be the ones that come out and that are popular, but she's got a song, and she's opening her mouth, and she's singing. She's, she's, she's singing. Under, she's worship. Some of you just need to open your mouth and begin to sing. I don't know where you are in your life, but if you'll just begin to sing and say, I, I praise you, God. I magnify you. are worthy. You're beautiful. I give you praise. If you'll just begin to sing, that is worship. Why do we sing together? Because it's worship. 
Hallelujah. It's not a style. It's not a denomination. It's not a church thing. It's not a Brother Winslow thing. It's a Bible thing. We sing together. Somebody say amen. amen. The next word is tuda. It's an extension of the hand. Anybody remember, everybody see somebody do this before? You ever wonder why do we raise our hands, lift our hands? Because the Bible says when you worship, you are to da, to extend the hand to a vow adoration. It's found in your Bible in Psalms 50 and 14. It says offer to God thanksgiving. That word thanksgiving isn't what you think. Thank you, Lord. It's not what it means. It's how we translated it. But in Hebrew, it means to extend the hand in adoration. When he says give thanks unto the Lord, it's not thank you, Lord, and keep driving. It's, it's you, you pause and you raise those hands and you begin to give him adoration. Why do we raise our hands? Because that's worship. That's what it means. When you in your life, wherever you are, what you're dealing with, if you'll just raise those hands and begin to worship him and say, I love you, God. You may not feel it. Listen, emotions don't have everything to do with anything. You can feel God, yes. But even when you don't feel it, if you'll raise those hands and begin to praise God and magnify him, that is worship. I may not feel it, but here it is, God. I may be going through hell and troubles and trials and situations, and it's chaotic, but here's my hands. I'm going to extend them to you, and I'm going to praise you. That is adoration, and that is worship. Now, these are just some. These aren't all of them. Can we stand? Nor am I insinuating that tomorrow you've got to pull out the list and say, I will begin with this one. I will go to this one next. That's not what Brother Winslow is saying. What I'm trying to say is for us to understand that God is seeking. God is seeking us. Too many times we think that God is seeking us just to pull us out of trouble. God is seeking me to bless me, of course. But God is also seeking people that will worship Him. Become a worshiper. There are many more things in God's word that talk about worship. But these are just some of the prominent ones that are in the word of God that can give us an idea, not just of what's happening around you, not just what you see people doing and you think, why are they doing that? Why do you Pentecostals do that? Why, why does that church shout like that? It's, it's because we have understand that God's word says something about worship. And I don't know where you are this morning. I don't know the troubles in your life. And you may be dealing with all sorts of things. But I know this. That there is a principle of the worshiper that changes everything. It changes everything. What would happen in just a moment as we gather together in this altar? What would happen if you came to this altar and you put some of this into practice? If you came to this altar and you extended your hand and you lifted those hands and maybe you, you've never done that before. Or maybe today you're like, man, I, don't, I, I just really didn't think that was for everybody, Brother Winslow. I thought that was just for the extroverts and those people that just, you know, they, they just, that's kind of what they need. I don't really need to do that to make it. I just talk to God in my mind. And I, I'm good, and I don't need all that worship and shouting and all of that. And, and I know you don't need it. You don't need it. But he wants it. It's not about you. It's about him. And what would happen if you came to this altar and, and, and instead of us, listen to me, watch this now. Instead of us laying hands on you for you to be healed. Instead of us laying hands on you that God would bring you out of something. Instead of us laying hands on you and, and God reaching in and changing some circumstances. What would happen instead of us doing that? You came to an altar and we all together just raised our hands and we put into practice what we've heard preach and we begin to worship Him and praise Him and we begin to talk to Him and say, I love you, Lord. I, everything's not right in my life, but I praise you. I'm going to tell you what I believe will happen. I believe that what anointing you for healing will do, I think today in worship and adoration and praise to Him, I believe God will respond. And I believe God will come into where you are. And God will say, yeah, I hear you worshiping me. 
I see the tears. I see the pain. I know how hard it is to raise your hands. I get it. I understand it. I know not everything is right and I know everything's perfect. But I see you trying to praise me in spite of all the things going on in your life. You're trying to worship me. And I believe that God is going to honor that. God is going to move into your life and God's going to do things that you've never seen before. I wonder if we can do that. Can we do that today? Can we put into action the simple fact that I want to be a worshiper? I want to invite everybody who would like to come to the front and I want us to put that into action. Listen, bring with you your trouble. Bring with you your worries. Bring with you your stress. Bring with you all the things in your life that are heavy. Bring it with you. But also bring some praise to God. Just lift those hands. That's it all across this place. Come on, that's it. Let's not get so advanced that we don't know how to just simply raise those hands and worship Him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Doesn't matter where you're from. Come on, it doesn't matter where you're from this morning. You say, Brother Winslow, but I don't have this and I don't have that. It doesn't matter. God just wants you to worship Him. You say, Brother Winslow, but I've messed up. And I've done some wrong things. And I've messed up bad. It doesn't matter. Just get in these altars, raise those hands. And just ask God to forgive you. Ask God to cleanse you. Ask God to to take away all spot and wrinkles. Ask God to forgive you. And God will. And you can raise those hands. And you can magnify Him. I wonder if we can do that all across this place. If we can raise those hands up and begin to praise Him. Come on, extend those hands and magnify him. Take a moment before we leave today and begin to say how wonderful he is, how beautiful he is, how magnificent he is, how glorious he is, how holy he is. God, there is nothing too hard for you. There is no sickness that you cannot heal. There is no disease that you cannot heal. There is no chaos that you cannot solve. There is no sin that you cannot forgive. There is no one that you cannot redeem. There is no one that you cannot bring back in who has found themselves outside of the ark. You, God, can do anything. Come on, let's do that. Can we all across this place? I know you're hurting, but in the midst of the pain, can you glorify Him? Ah, Hallelujah. Come on, I know know things don't make sense in your life, but can you praise Him anyhow? Hallelujah. Come on, hallelujah. Come on, this is beautiful. This is beautiful to praise Him, to magnify Him, for He's seeking and He's searching worshipers. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, I don't have it figured out, but I'm going to praise you. I don't have the answer, but I'm going to worship you. I don't know what tomorrow's going to bring, but I've come to praise you and lift you up and magnify you. Oh, come on, let that sweep through the house today. Let worship sweep through the house today. begin to adore Him. As you begin to magnify Him, watch God take off the stress. Watch God remove the anxieties. Watch God bring healing to your body. There's something about worship and praise and magnifying Him that can change everything. Come 